Now, next, I should like to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Cannon, who is Executive Vice President of the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he is in this new role, uh, which was created to provide strategic leadership and administrative oversight at the university. Uh, previously, he was Director of Operations at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland, and he's going to speak to us about the future of university and international collaboration. But what I'm going to do is actually, I'm, I'm going to look back a little bit. I'm going to reflect on, on, on my time in, in HE. I spent 30 years in, in the UK higher education, and through that time, it's been an enormous period of change. And I think from that basis, I want to sort of then look forward to the future. So if I can just get this right. So when we started, I, I went to university in 1976, and that seems like an awful long time ago. And in that year, that was the first year that Concord flew. The Soweto riots were ongoing, Chairman Mao died, Steve Jobs launched his first uh, Apple machine. And that was in 1976. I graduated in 1980, and I was one of 4, 42,000 students who graduated at that, in that time. In 2011, some 350,000 undergraduates graduated from UK universities, and in addition, another 194,000, uh, 97,000 uh, higher degree programs came through. A massive change in that time. It's that transition that corresponds with my career that I want to talk about. I think there've been four periods uh, throughout my career, a golden age that, that really never was, the rise of a manager, the surrogate for the market, and the primacy of the market, and I want to talk a little bit about that. The golden age, this was the, a time that, that never was, but where the civil servant came down from Westminster placed the money under a tree and the vice chancellor came down from his ivory tower and took the money back up to the thing. The age never was, but it was a much easier time. Management in universities really only came about during the 1980s and it came about as resources began to get tight. And the rise of the manager was the rise of universities as complex organizations. It was only in the mid 1980s in the United Kingdom that universities were asked to link financial planning and academic planning, and vice chancellors were seen for the first time as chief executives of complex organizations. And at the same time, there's an increasing professionalization and the support of those organizations. A surrogate for the market in the United Kingdom, they have a funding council that sits between the state and the universities that are funded by the state. And the funding councils uh, set the target for the number of students, set the target for the number of students you could take, and set a price for that. And there was a balance, a trade-off between autonomy on the one hand and accountability on the other. Universities were recognized to operate better when they operated by themselves, but equally government were conscious of an investment in public funds. So universities were not free from the state, they never have been, but they were free to do things. And it was a practical bargain, a balance between accountability on the one hand and autonomy on the other. And I remember speaking to a minister during the 1990s, and it wasn't you, Bill, but the minister, who was a Scottish minister at the time, said our policy for higher education is we have no policy for higher education. And that seemed to settle by everyone. And then it changed. And it changed because of an increasing awareness of the economic and cultural impact of universities uh, in their societies, in their regions. These are figures that relate to Scotland, um, and it shows that uh, at, uh, higher education institutions are a major asset in an economy. Um, the number of overseas students that come along, and the impact on the local economy. Income and expenditure has a multiplier of, 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 of 1.4. For every 10 pounds spent by a university, another four is produced in the local economy. For every job, in the, two jobs in the university, a further job is created in the economy. And increasingly, politicians became aware of that. And it, it prompted Roderick Flood at London Metropolitan University to say that higher education is too important to be left to itself. And then the introduction of student fees in, 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 in the last 10 years has seen an introduction of a market. And increasingly, the state to regulate that market is looking at corporate governance models from the private sector and importing them into the public sector. They're looking for corporate governance models to secure accountability and performance in increasingly a, a, a market, so the primacy of the market. So over those 30 years, we've seen a changing role for the state from facilitator to evaluator to regulator. It was once the role of government to provide for universities of colleges, and it's now seen as being 
universities and colleges role to provide for government in return for funds. Increased funding is on a something for something basis with governments looking to universities to provide ulterior goals. Higher education as a means to an end, not as an end in itself. Let's talk a little bit about internationalization. Uh, internationalization, universities have always been global. Academics are global actors. They always have played on a global stage. The whole focus on internationalization has come to the fore within the last 10 years. The Shanghai Jiao Tong Inde uh, Index was only brought forward in 2003. It was followed by the QS uh, Times Higher Education work in 2004. And then a key article appeared in The Economist in 2005 called The Brains Business. And that described as a hugely influential article we started to describe this super league of world-class universities, a government obsession with producing Ivy Leagues, and it argued that the great universities of the 19th century, while well, they were shaped by nationalism, the great universities going forward will be shaped by globalization. And it's obvious, it's an international academic marketplace, a global labor force, global language, speed of communications, and we're citizens in a global economy. But let's look at the QS World Top Rankings, 2000, they're the 2013 numbers, dominated by US institutions. And you ask yourself, why is that? They've got a monopoly of those institutions, they meet the access challenge, why? Less dependent on the state, diversified income sources, intense competition, global strategies. My own uh, university, Hong Kong University, is 26 in the, in the QS rankings. But what's remarkable about Hong Kong is that it contains two, four, five universities in the top 200 in the world. And it has a population of only 7 million. It performs all, or outperforms all other uh, state sectors, given its size and the state support. And it's recently moved to a new four-year degree, but that's seen the introduction of 1,000 new international faculty into the region. An explicit and funded commitment to internationalize. And it's not, uh, so does world class count? Of course it does. 55 Nobel Prize winners uh, in economics come from the University of Chicago. The figures in the States all stand for themselves. With the US as an international faculty, it recruits more old international PhD students than any other OECD country put together. But of those students that go to the States to do PhDs, 66% of them stay there. Only 2% of academics in France are foreign born. 7% of newly, hi newly hired professors in the United States are alumni of which they teach. In France, the figure is 50%, and in Spain, it's a staggering 95%. And in the US, in the, 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 the chart, in the, the top 100, Spain has no universities, France has one. In the developing world, you'd be well aware of what's happening in terms of the Far East, in China, India, and in Sub-Saharan Africa. So why internationalize? Again, these, 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 these uh, Stats are well known to you, it improves student preparedness, internalizes the curricula, strengthens research, diversifies faculties and staff, it matters for institutions, and it matters more for governments. Develop a national university system within a global framework, uh, skilled workforce, higher education funds to promote national participation, and benefit from trade and education services. It also allows universities to make money, enhance prestige and status, and to move up the rankings. But in the context of the challenges we now face, and I want to spend a minute talking about those, should we all continue to strive to internationalize? 16,000 universities all aiming to be in the world's top 200. So let's have a look at those challenges. I think universities, certainly for the first time, are going to, for the first time in my experience, are significantly over budgeted and underfunded. And as funding declines, cost management is increasingly the key. Institutional managers like myself really for the first time are having to deal with the reducing uh, uh, cost pressure. There's intense competition, competition to attract the very best students, competition to attract the very best faculty. We need to be much better than we are at setting our priorities. We make too many decisions in the dark. We take too many, uh, we, we seek to please across the entire spectrum of the institution. Often we cannot do that. Technology upgrades, we've spoken about already uh, this morning a little bit, but it moves at the speed of cyber space. We need to rethink our infrastructure. My old university in Aberdeen, we did an analysis of the uh, utilization of space 
across the university. We found that we used our space for only 40% of its usable time. No other industry, no other company could, could do that. So we need to rethink our infrastructure. We need to link uh, more clearly than we do our programs to our outcomes. We need to see where training and market demand intersect. We need to attract the best and the brightest faculty. And we need to be serious about our commitment to sustainability. The access agenda is something that we cannot take for granted. We have to have education for all. And we have new responsibilities and reporting requirements in the age that we now face. And the solutions, I would suggest, we need to grow our revenue. We need to reduce our oper operating margins. We need to improve our asset efficiency and we need to manage expectations and strengths of our stakeholders, our staff, and our students more than we've been able to do in the past. So funding and revenue growth briefly. We need to incorporate an operational element into strategic planning. By that, I mean we have to be realistic about what we can achieve. We have to streamline our governance processes, empower stakeholders to make informed budgetary decisions, and allocate the resources. We need to be better define roles and responsibilities, improve our information tracking, explore innovative public-private partnerships, and enhance our brands in an effort to attract institutional investment. We need to leverage social media to the extent to which our students and our parents, their parents and our alumni would expect us, improve the tracking of research income, and consider our global strategies reduce our operating margins, implement leverage technologies, engage in a more sophisticated planning and structural format, pinpoint opportunities to share services, eliminate program redundancies and inefficient processes. Improve the asset efficiency I've spoken briefly about, review our regional delivery models and extend access to programs, identify student populations, engage in sustainable initiatives and rationalize our IT and estate portfolios. And finally, I think what we need to do more is to manage our expectations and strengths. We need to make sure that we are engaged with all our stakeholders and lever those technical innovations to engage our students and improve our services. And all that has to be done against com in a competitive market where we uh, benchmark against our institutions, competitive competitor institutions that share best practice with them. And finally, throughout all of that, uh, throughout those uh, 30 years, um, I, I, I'm taken back to a, 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 a set of values that, that were instilled in with me right, right at the start. I began my career at the University of Warwick uh, in the early 80s. And Warwick was um, a new university, a relatively new university with a blank piece of paper. Um, and the registrar at Warwick at the time was a guy called Mike Shattuck. And Mike had this set of values, and they've stayed with me over the over the journey. Uh, and what Mike talked about really above all was a respect for academic success. That, that, that notwithstanding everything I've talked about, what we need is a respect for academic success. That world-class excellence is really the only acceptable benchmark. That what we need is mutually supportive, formal and informal relationships at all levels between the department, schools, and at the center. An acceptance that academic initiatives cannot be programmed and that decision-making in such matters will necessarily be untidy. A belief that decisions are best made openly, that the turning cycle is a small one. Good financial management, both as a means of facilitating academic initiative and as a means of ensuring accountability. But above all, the conviction that good ideas will always attract funding. And a belief that TAC is the best form of defense, optimism, risk-taking, and a willingness to attempt new things represents a much better policy than caution, cutbacks, and academic conservatism. Thank you very much indeed.